Greetings, brethren. In the name of the only beloved Christ Jesus, and welcome to our presentation. Today we'll be discussing the topic of laying siege on mother. This is something that's become of current uh, agitation um, due to some groups posting live videos of their siege efforts on Facebook and elsewhere, YouTube. So we thought it would be a good opportunity to look at the historical foundation of this effort and then examine or suggest some current methods and strategies in which to reach the Seventh-day Adventist Church with the, with the message of the shepherd's rod. So it all begins with the verse in Ezekiel chapter 4, laying siege against the city. And it reads, and lay siege against it, and build a fort against it, and cast a mount against it. Set the camp also against it, and set battering rams against it round about. Ezekiel 4.2 To lay siege against it means, of course, to invade it with an army of reformatory workers and compel it to surrender, to come to the knowledge of the truth herein revealed. Very evident it is, then, that the message of the hour, and it alone, should be brought before the people of God. And this is found in Shepherd's Rod Track, or uh, edition, page 74. And it goes on to explain the details about the meaning of the camp, the battering rams, and so forth. But the key core essence here to lay siege is to bring the message of the hour, which is the Shepherd's Rod, to the people of God, the Seventh-day Adventist Church. So our question today is, What's the historical basis for, for this, and how should we go about actually doing it in a Christian way? So, let us begin by asking, where, when did the siege begin? Well, we'll find here in this passage, in Timely Greetings, Volume 2, number 39, page 9, it tells us, Furthermore, Ezekiel is commanded to lay siege against it, to take it. Now, since this Jerusalem stands for the church, while among the Gentiles, and since God commands his own servant, the prophet, to besiege it, to pr protest against it, and to take it, it is therefore obvious that the church, the Jerusalem here portrayed, is shown as having been drawn away from God, and that God is endeavoring to rescue her, to effect a reformation in her midst. For such cause, therefore, is Ezekiel's siege. Finally, since the Christian church Jerusalem, away from its original geographical location, was for the first time in history so attacked or besieged by Martin Luther, by the Protestant Reformation, the fulfillment of this prophecy obviously commences with Luther. This fact will be seen throughout the chapter as we continue to study it verse by verse. So the Reformation, started by Martin Luther, was the beginning of the siege. And notice the key words here. To lay siege is to really protest against the sins in the church and call for, or effect a Reformation. And that's the core essence of laying siege. So we can learn many lessons from our Protestant forefathers about the way to lay siege or protest against the sins of of God's people. Now in the shepherd's rod, uh, the period of Brother Hadith, a camp was built with a specific purpose. And we'll read this statement here in Symbolic Code, Volume 3, Number 1, Page 7, uh, written by Brother E.T. Wilson. He says, Being one of the three who were privileged to be sent out two years ago to spy out the land, Mount Carmel Center, the fruit of our quest, naturally holds a large place in my heart, and each visit made to the center of God's closing work for the church, where a camp is being builded for the purpose of laying siege against the city, is always looked forward to with great pleasure. Now, Brother Wilson, of course, was one of the pioneers that spied out the land when they relocated the publishing work, the storehouse from California out to Waco, Texas in 1935, and he wrote this particular one in 1937. And that camp was built up for 20 years for the purpose of laying siege on Mother. 
And so Old Mount Carmel, Waco, Texas, existed from 1935 to 1955 to the death of Brother Haddaf. And it comprised several aspects. It was a physical camp built up on 375 acres of land, and it was comprised of the following. Uh, the central pillar was the Universal Publishing Association, which had started in California, but entailed the publishing work of the Shepherd's Rod message. That was the real core effort to uh, reach the church with the message of the Shepherd's Rod. It also included administrative facilities, buildings where there were offices, the publishing work, um, dormitories, uh, cafeterias, uh, school buildings, all kinds of things to train up these workers. There was an educational department consisting of a school for children and a school of prophets, the DLI, uh, Davidic Levitical Institute, the ministerial training program to train up these reformatory workers to go out in the name of the shepherd's rod and reach the church. There was an infirmary to take care of sick people with a full-time nurse. There were, was a rest home for the elderly. And Brother Haddaf took this very seriously. It was a grossly neglected aspect that the Seventh-day Adventist Church was not taking care of their old people. There were agricultural enterprises, a, a commercial peach orchard, a full-sized uh, dairy herd. They were basically completely self-sufficient in raising their own food and selling it for income. And then there was residential housing for, for over 100 workers, families, children and so forth. So this really is unique uh, precedent. It's never been reproduced since 1955, uh, even though there's been efforts. Nobody has fulfilled this complete program of, of, of having a center to train up workers. Uh, despite uh, efforts, everything falls woefully short in the era after the death of Brother Haddaf. So what do we do today? Well, Towards the end of this era, Brother Haddaf instituted what was known as the hunting campaign in this period, in, starting in 1952. And it was all based on this scripture uh, in Jeremiah 16, verse 16, it reads, Behold, I will send for many fishers, saith the Lord, and they shall fish them, and after will I send for many hunters, and they shall hunt them from every mountain and from every hill and out of the holes of the rocks. So the fishing was the literature that had been going out for almost 20 years. Uh, and in it, at its peak, it was estimated there was a mailing list of 50,000 Seventh-day Adventists. And this literature went out on the order of 50,000 pieces a month. So uh, Brother Haddaf instituted this campaign to then uh, hunt out these folk that had been receiving this literature. So he bought a sold off some land and bought a uh, whole fleet of cars to reach the Seventh-day Adventists across the entire United States and hunt them out, literally, uh, house to house. So the history of this uh, sets a foundation and a lot of education for us to learn the proper me methods to reach our brethren in the church or to lay siege. So let's look at this. Well, this is from a, a historical document published uh, after the death of Brother Haddaf, but that campaign continued uh, until the late 50s, and it involved the primary uh, use of the Shepherd's Rod series of literature. At that time, it was Shepherd's Rod Volume 1 and 2, the two books, and then the various track literature, which was compiled into these individual volumes, like all the answer books into one volume, all the TGs into another very nice, convenient package, but it's all the original pocket-sized literature. And then that's when these the small charts were developed or instituted for Bible workers to carry around conveniently um, in house to house. So it says here, during the years 1952 to 1958, Davidian representatives traveled throughout the United States and other countries, personally uh, contacting many thousands of Seventh-day Adventists at their home. So this was a, literally a door-to-door -door effort. So here's a picture of some of those workers. It was husbands and wives, uh, individuals that were trained up and went out uh, to knock on doors and reach the Seventh day Adventist brethren. Here, uh, they had a fleet of cars and they traveled far and wide. Here's a picture of some of those uh, brethren in their 
vehicles. Uh, here's an interesting map showing the progress of the hunting campaign. Um, you notice here over um, from 1953 to 54, mainly the south and the east coast of the United States, and then later the Midwest, the area in blue, which was covered in 1955 up through 1957. The red area was the west, was covered in 1956. And we spoke uh, personally with some Davidians, Brother Sidney and Bonnie Smith, who themselves traveled the entire state of Montana and much of Wyoming. So um, uh, so it was a full-time effort and it considered uh, uh, consumed a, a considerable amount of time to literally meet these people in their houses scattered about throughout the vast realms of the United States. So that was the effort. Um, however, after Brother Haddiff died, you, Florence Haddiff and her council began to introduce some compromises to the message, in particular the literature, but in terms of the methods of evangelism or laying siege, um, they instituted some things we might want to look at more carefully. Uh, in 1958, there was a general conference session in Cleveland, Ohio. This is where the worldwide body of the Seventh-day Adventist Church was gathered together, so it was a great place to evangelize. Brother Haddiff himself visited the general conference session in 1950, wrote the track general conference special in 1950. So clearly, uh, going to these areas where Evans congregated is definitely uh, a recommended strategy. But this is what uh, Florence and her council did. They rented a room, a meeting room in this hotel, the in Cleveland, Ohio, the Holdenden Hotel, and they put a nice sign out in the lobby to gather the attention of 70 of us who were, were staying in the hotel. So it was very public. They also put placards and uh, rented space on the side of the city buses. So this was very visible to the entire world there, everybody around. Um, and it also says that during the summer 1957, they put these placards on cars and they visited seven-day Adventist camp meetings, every single one in the United States. Think about this. <laughs> um, I don't think that a, a tenth of the camp meetings are visited today by Davidians. Um, so they were very active and very visible. I mean, look at this. Here, they even rented out uh, advertising space in the local Cleveland Press newspaper. This full-size ad uh, advertising meetings in the hotel three times a day inviting Adventists to come here, the Shepherd's Rod presented, and then this open letter to the church detailing the, uh, outlining the basics of the message. Uh, here's this open appeal published in a newspaper for the whole world to see. So clearly they were not uh, hiding anything. Uh, they were very visibly agitating the message. Now this idea of putting placards on top of the cars and going around to churches and uh, camp meetings was instituted. Um, and here's some examples. Uh, notice that it's a uniform sign. It was not handmade. It was professionally done. Um, now here we see on the top photo a car in front of the first Seventh-day Adventist church in Dallas, Texas. And notice there's three police cars lined up. And um, why was that? Uh, were they creating disturbance? Well, we talked and interviewed with some Davidians, older Davidians that were actually part of this. And one of the things they were doing that this particular brother felt very uncomfortable with and, and raises a need for question is they were started using the bullhorn. And one really needs to think about that because a bullhorn is very aggressive and it creates a disturbance. Um, and that's something that we would want to pause and think about. Do we? Is this the way we really want to reach the church? But anyway, that's where the precedent for this started. And this really began to raise questions at that time. Is this the best way to reach the church? Is to go out and bullhorn them uh, in front of the church and create a disturbance? We're going to see more on this later here. So what are some suggested messages? messages, uh, uh, methods for witnessing for the shepherd's rod that are clearly established in the original shepherd's rod and are endorsed by Brother Haddiff. Well, clearly, uh, 
to visit Seventh-day Adventist churches as you're able and participate in Sabbath school and worship services. Use these opportunities to uh, to befriend Seventh-day Adventists and tactfully gather names and addresses so that you can send them tract literature at some point, or perhaps Bible out Bible study outlines. Also, it may be an opportunity to invite them for personal Bible studies at your home, or maybe they'll invite you to their home, especially if you're a visitor. And this is this name gathering campaign, as Brother Howdoff called it, is clearly outlined here in. Uh, Symbolic code number seven, or volume seven, numbers one to six, pages two and three. So clearly, this is a time tested and profit endorsed method to reach a church. And Davidians have practiced this for, for decades um, and continue to do so to this day. And there's no fault in this. Having a right deportment, uh, we don't want to be rude or disruptive of church services. I've seen this, unfortunately, in some cases. And this is not appropriate. We want to be proper Christians and raise our hand, and even if we're shunned or ignored, but to speak in order and in harmony with the lesson and not force our message on anybody. However, what happens if uh, you're identified as a shepherd drive believer and then cast out of the church and, and told you, you, you can't attend, the police will be called, maybe the police are called in. So what are your options? Well, basically, one, you can uh, dust off your feast and go to another city, visit another church, just like the Bible says in Mark chapter 6, verse 11, and Luke chapter 9, verses 5 and 6. This may entail driving considerable distances as your name becomes more well-known. On the other hand, it may be necessary uh, to protest against the abuses of a local church by walking up and down on the sidewalk in front of the church before and after church worship services. And this is a tactic that's been taken up by the Siege Ministry and has been recently promoted on Facebook and YouTube. However, one should be very careful in so doing so as not to create a disruption during the divine worship services uh, because this would cast a reproach. So there is a time and place to do this. Here's another option that we would like to share that's done by Brother Hadoff, um, is visit venues where large numbers of Seventh-day Adventists are gathered away from their local churches, such as camp meetings, youth meetings, ASI conventions, uh, local and general conference sessions. If you're prohibited from sharing the message inside the venue because it's located on public property, then you can make use of public areas surrounding the venue to engage in classical street preaching. And this has been our experience. Uh, they're naturally not going to give you a place in their venue um, to preach the message. So you can use it as an opportunity to befriend people, gather names. But if you want to give out literature or... Uh, talk in behalf of the message, you usually will be relegated to a free speech zone out on the sidewalk or along a highway. And so there's ways you can use that, and we'll talk about this more. So please follow along with us. So classical street preaching. This is really nothing new under the sun. It's part of our great Protestant heritage. Um, for example, Charles Wesley, um, now remember this is one of the grains in Ezekiel 4, the bean, the grace of the Methodist Church. He was uh, one of the co-founders of the Methodist Church. And during his day in England, uh, it was forbidden to preach without a license um, by the state. And of course, that meant controlled religion. And the Wesley brothers, Charles and uh, John, popularized the method of taking the gospel to the street, even though it was forbidden. And many times they were persecuted and arrested these, but this phenomena, this whole practice of taking the gospel to the street and preaching to a crowd uh, was developed and it's brought to the United States and it's part of our great American tradition of freedom of speech and freedom of religion is to go to the street and anywhere in America you will see this on college campuses and uh, downtown areas of large cities um, uh, people engaging in street preaching and it's a very uh, solid method and it's something that we can learn a lot of lessons from. 
Here, for example, is, uh, is uh, this was taken during the GC session in San Antonio, uh, Texas, in 2015. And here's an individual that uh, was street preaching. Now, when you open that door to freedom of speech, you open the door to any kind of message. And in this particular one, one you may disagree with. Uh, this particular person was uh, standing in his truck along the street legally, uh, warning that Ellen White was a liar and saying it was adulterer. So he was out there creating quite a disturbance. He had a bullhorn. So he was obnoxious and obviously preaching a false message. Now, it really didn't gather a lot of traction with 70 Adventist, um, but you could arguably say it was kind of a reproach. It was annoying. Um, I don't think he had much traction. People paid much attention. He was out there for about an hour till his voice wore out. But this might be an example of a way maybe not to do, give the message, or give a message, especially since it was blatantly false. Um, and kind of amateurish. You see the handmade signs and uh, obviously uh, 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 a very provoking message. But clearly one guaranteed under the Constitution. In contrast, um, here this individual was a professional street preacher uh, standing on the sidewalk. We came up and here he was with this nice sign with a very clear cut message, warning sins against God, lining them out. And Seventh-day Adventists, this is right in front of the convention center. So they're all around this guy. And they're like looking at him like a spectacle. And I thought, who is this guy? Well, afterwards, we talked to him. He wasn't even a Seventh-day Adventist. As I said, he was a professional. He went around doing this full-time, uh, very well practiced. Um, he stood out there. Now, he didn't have a bullhorn, but he stood out with a very clear voice and preached and warned about the sins in the world. And this is interesting. This is the day after the Supreme Court uh, sanctioned gay marriage in the United States. So he was talking about that and other sins and abominations, clearly calling uh, sin by its right name, warning of God's judgments, calling for repentance, and inviting people to turn to Jesus. He was out there for about four hours from 10 to 2. They're very programmed. They have a specific time frame. They're very clear cut, clean cut. Um, and there's a lot to learn from these uh, individuals. We spent some time with him and learned a lot about the legal issues, about where to preach. Uh, this individual has got a lot of experience. He, They go into gay festivals and gay parades. And uh, so they get right in the thick of it. Uh, he told an experience, they went to one called Sodom Fest in Minneapolis, a, a, a hotbed of gay homosexual uh, activities. And they said it got so contested that the police had to uh, protect them and escort them because they were literally threatened with their lives. So the angry mob of gay men were, were preparing to kill them. So uh, beat them up and, and, and have them hurt. So interesting, uh, the experiences. And, and he gave us a lot of good counsel and, and encouragement how to engage in street preaching. And we'll come back to him in his sign here in a little bit. So what do we have besides the basic gospel? Well, we have the advanced message of the shepherd's rod and these beautiful charts that in Holy Spirit inspired artwork that God has given us through the shepherd's rod. So why not use them? So we feel one of the best methods to, to use in street preaching is to include setting up large size shepherd's rod study charts to engage passers-by, seven-day Adventist. Also set up a table on which to place original shepherd's rod track literature for distribution. One can also make placards with short statements to engage in observers. So in Atlanta, the GC session in Atlanta in 2010, in Atlanta, Georgia, we j just finished the original charts. We didn't have them uh, on a chart roll, but we displayed them as artwork and set them out on the sidewalk. And this had a very interesting effect. We let the charts do the speaking. Um, and we noticed that when the 70 Adams poured out of these uh, venues, that most were careless, they passed by. But there was always somebody that would stop and be engaged by this, and that afforded us an opportunity to approach them and enter into a rational discussion about the message, the original shepherd's rod message. 
Here's a brother in uh, San Antonio 2015 with a complete set of charts on a stand. So that way we you could go flip between different charts. And the little table there had the literature, the original literature. Now, we picked a venue right in front of the convention center where there's a lot of traffic. And in so doing, you're going to get other free speech people. And and that's no problem. This old gentleman was campaigning for Ben Carson um, and befriend them. Um, actually street preachers tend to look out for each other, even though we may not have the same mission or purpose, um, in case there's any kind of trouble. And we didn't have any trouble at this point, but it's an opportunity to mingle with other people exercising their First Amendment rights to free speech. So what are some placard statements? Well, we really think it's best to uplift the Word of God, so here's some examples you could Put this, the voice of the Lord crieth into the city, the seven day of his church, hear ye the rod, and he who hath appointed, Micah 6 9. Or quench not the spirit, despise not prophesying, prove all things, hold fast to that which is good. First Thessalonians 5, 19 to 21. Or how about this? Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Second Timothy 2.15. Or, for the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. 1 Peter 4, 17. Or, cease ye from man whose breath is in his nostri nostrils. Isaiah 2, verse 22. Or, we also have a more sure word of prophecy. 2 Peter 1, verse 19. And there are other scriptures, but these are very specific uh, venues or opening appeals to investigate the shepherd's rod. Um and great for placards. Now here's the siege ministers. This ministry operates in Michigan and I think there's a group in Florida. They have made these homemade signs, some with scripture appeals, Isaiah 820 to the Law and the Testament. Also these handmade signs with various messages um, going out in front of primarily churches, local churches. Now there are other placard statements that could be used. For example, um, it is the judgment of living that we need to hear now. Or it is present truth the flock needs to hear now. These are based on spirit of prophecy type of ideas that can be condensed into a sign. Or present truth always creates opposition. Certainly true. Are you striving to be one of the 144,000? The leading men are leading you into darkness. We must all uh, we must sigh and cry for all the abominations done in the church. So these are some ideas. There's many others uh, that could be done to make placards or signs. However, we want to come back to this professional street preacher. Notice this sign. It's professional. It's simple. It's plain, but graphically, it's well s simple, but very well laid out. It. At the top, sins against God, and then it lists them in a list, plainly. Any, there's a whole complete message here on this. Unbelief, rejecting Jesus, hating God's law, uh, homosexuality, abortion, stealing, bringing us down to what? Judgment. God's soon coming judgment, the need for repentance or perishing, and then the appeal to turn to Jesus. Notice the appeal here. Uh, this man looking, there's a complete message right there in writing that can assist as you're preaching. And I think that's a good example. You can make multiple copies of this. It's not hand done. It's not a one-off thing. It's not crude. It's uh, clean and clear cut. And I think this is a professional thing that uh, we should strive for. So it's nothing wrong with copying something, especially if it's done right. So we took this concept and said, well, let's apply it to the shepherd's rod. For example, we could say Seventh-day Adventist abominations and then itemize a list based on what's in the original rod, uh, lack of reverence in the church, following worldly fashions, merchandising on the Sabbath, uh, in need of no more truth, failing to investigate, abortions on demand, trusting in the arm of flesh, disbelief in the spirit of prophecy. All these things are abominations laid out plainly there, and they will result in judgment that begins the house of God, and we're called to hear the rod. And 
the appeal to reform, turn to Jesus. So one could make copies of this in a placard that's very clean cut. It's professional. It's not looking amateurish. Um, and other themes along this line. But here's a complete message in, uh, in, um, on a placard that, has, that starts, it gives a warning and calls for reform. And that's the essence of laying siege. Now, what about attending general conference sessions and camp meetings? This is one that we have had um, some experience and success at. And it's truly a venue to look at. Uh, why? Well, here's the general conference session, Atlanta, Georgia, 2010. This is inside the Georgia Dome on the last Sabbath. There's all over 70,000 70 inhabitants inside of this football stadium, or the Georgia Dome from around the world, over 2,000 delegates and their families on the floor, and then Seventh-day Adventists worldwide from every country. So what better opportunity to mingle and reach with our brethren? So we attended the divine worship services, and then afterwards we went to the street. And here's a Bible worker that stood out with this original Shepherd's Rod artwork. And let that do the speaking. There were no bullhorns involved. And as people passed by, there were individuals that would stop and engage and say, hmm. And they were not familiar with this. So every opportunity that happened was we approached them and were able to talk to them and share with them. Either they asked or we offered. Every single one took a literature. In this case, the White House recruiter, which explained the details of this particular 11th hour message. So as 11th hour workers... And it's interesting because other Davidians took note of this and said, hmm, this is, this is the way we should do it. Because in contrast, there were brethren from Waco that were very aggressive, you know, in-your-face type of aggressive proselytizing. And this really is kind of a reproach, you know, uh, yelling at people or getting aggressive or forcing literature in them really is not the best approach. There is a better way. Um, to engage people, because not everybody's going to hear, but if they see it, then they're accountable. Um, here's the GC session, San Antonio. Um, a brother standing out, now quite a crowd around here. Most of them are careless and indifferent. But in this, notice there's always somebody that will examine this. You're not beating them over the head. You're not bullhorning them. But you're waiting for them to an opportunity to engage the passerby, and surely enough, it happens. Okay, here we are in front of the Hyatt, going around to the entrance of the convention center, this plaza. This will get packed full of people, but here we are. Here's a little table with the tracks on it. Brother Scott, Church. Hi, Brother Scott. <laughs> Lots of people could go by. There's no word. Everybody's taking pictures. Busy place. Hello. Now, in this little clip, we'd set up early in the morning, and I think this is a Friday morning, and people are going in and out, most people passing by. But in this process, notice that woman over on the left. People are looking at this thing. They're engaging. They're seeing it. And in their mind, they're wondering, hmm, what is this? And what happens is that somebody will stop at some point. And inquire and then you engage them and say are you familiar with this vision in Zechariah 6 um, horses chariots and of course they don't know anything about it and that opens a door for a discussion that could last anywhere from 30 seconds to sometimes an hour or more in that process oftentimes what happened now we had another brother with a chart also by is it, it would create a crowd. People would stop, and, it, and all of a sudden a crowd would develop, and people are listening. They, there's no yelling or shouting. Um, 
And in that process, what we noticed is you're, you have this great opportunity to witness for the rod. Uh, people will sometimes ask questions. You can answer them. Uh, they will clear up misconceptions about what the shepherd's rod is. But we hid nothing. Um, and in those cases, it was the best opportunity. People took literature or often asked for it, and we gave them the original uh, shepherd's rod tracks, tracks, uh, track number two, whatever it was. That was the, usually the best opportunity to get the literature in the people's hands and engage in conversation. So we're going to look at another video clip here of an actual engagement with an individual here. Okay, we're out on the streets about 3.45, 7. Brother Scott preaching on the streets. Well, when we can't give a good answer that makes them happy, everybody's going to be talking, and you know what? They'll be so scared that maybe that is where they say, okay, we need to get back to God. Something really crazy is going on in the world, and we need to get back to God because he's the only answer, and they may still think we're crazy. Okay, notice in this little clip here, uh, there's a dialogue, there's a discussion going on. And this particular young man was from, I believe, Serbia. He was very keenly interested. We spent hours with this man going over chart after chart. He was very keenly interested. He took all the literature. So that opportunity, and, and along the way, there were people that would come by, and it creates an opportunity for engagement. And notice that individual videotape it. We don't know what their purpose was, but people are curious. Uh, but they're there taping this presentation on the street, and who knows who's going to watch that video that man was shooting. Um, so uh, it is something that it is a very effective approach. Now, in this particular case, we should point out that we got criticism because the brother there was wearing a hat. Now, uh, clearly that shouldn't have been the case. He'd been out there all the day before and had been scorched by the sun. That was an unfortunate thing. It's something we all need to be corrected. Uh, but yes, we shouldn't be wearing hats. So we, we take that note in correction. But we learned from our experiences, and we learned a lot from actually going onto the street at the GC session and camp meetings and engaging people, not in a rude or aggressive way, but in a calm, dignified way to represent Christ in this beautiful message of the shepherd's rod. So are there other message, methods to lay siege on mother? Well, certainly there are today with the technology. For example, so, social media, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, WhatsApp, etc. And we ourselves make use of these. However, there's no substitute for the personal, the one-on-one, -on -one, because the problem with Facebook and Twitter is you hide behind anonymous names, and people can get kind of aggressive and disrespectful. But face-to-face -face is really the best way. But social media is also an effective means to witness when you're not able to go to camp meeting or so forth. Websites, active blogs, um, that's a dynamic where you can incorporate social media to promote your website or blogs and engage in comment dis sections uh, with people. And we found that very effective. Email campaigns, letter writing, phone calls, good old-fashioned ways, people that aren't as internet savvy, uh, or a combination. We, we do all of these things, um, and there's no reason we encourage people to do the same. Experiment. Get out there and do something. Don't sit back in the chair and criticize people or their efforts. Um, there's been some tendency to do that, but learn from ex uh, our mistakes uh, and others, and if you see a better way to do it, go out and do it. Um, there's no need to, uh, you know, virtue signal or, uh, you know, or boast yourself. Um, just simply go out and do it. There's no need to let the right hand know what the left hand is doing. We could have shot hours of video of our experiences. We got a couple little bits, but frankly, we were so busy engaging with people, there wasn't time really to shoot video. 
although there's a time and place, especially, I think, if there's a confrontation, it might be nice to have somebody video documenting that for uh, legal purposes. And finally, vehicle banners or billboards. Uh, we know of a brother uh, years ago that had a small RV that had statements and pictures posted all around his, uh, on the outside of his vehicle. And he would travel down to Key West, Florida, where a lot of 70 Avenues would winter, and park out in the street and um, out in the parks where Avenues frequented and engage them there. And he had literature with him and he had charts. So, uh, and he was a one-man operation um, that did this for years, uh, many years ago. So that's one way. Or billboards. Uh, there's some brethren from Davidian brethren from Florida that rented this uh, billboard in downtown Atlanta, GC Session 2010. Uh, it's really not obviously Shepherd's Rod, but they used the religious liberty angle uh, house uh, exposing Seventh-day Adventist Church, who claim to be champions of religious liberty, but in turn persecute and cast out the Shepherd's Rod. And they were documenting the history of this, so they used this as an avenue or an angle to uh, expose the hypocrisy of the church. Um, so a billboard, um, uh, that's another alternative. So be creative. Um, but in so doing, do so in the dignity of Christ, calm and respectful, and avoid methods that um, would be considered, uh, you know, like a bullhorn that kind of, you see at political rallies. It, it really tied to agitate people and, and get them riled up and aggressive. Um, there are other ways to do it and um, engage in discussion. And I think if you look at YouTube, uh, people that are active in the political arena, the ones that are most successful are, are the ones that engage in discussion with others rather than shouting them down uh, with bullhorns. So with that in mind, that concludes our presentation. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to contact us anytime. We're upa7.org, email upa5453 at gmail.com, or you can call us at 860-798-3672. Or better yet, subscribe, subscribe to our YouTube channel, Universal Publishing. For continued video updates we'll, we'll, um, on this and other topics, um, we have a wealth of material to share along these lines to lay siege. May God bless your efforts to plead with Mother and to usher in that long hoped for kingdom of God. For we are UPA7.org. We publish the original Shepherd's Rod literature, complete uh, in pocket size track form so you can make use of this publish your own and go forth and lay siege on mother may god bless you and godspeed